what we need. Thanks, Senator. Well, thank you. Thanks, Richard. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, identification of effect heterogeneity using instrumental variables. And uh, it, this will build on um, much of the discussion that Dylan presented this morning and, and our ongoing discussion on uh, instrumental variables. Um, uh, note that my focus is on effect heterogeneity and not response heterogeneity. And that's a, this is an important distinction, distinction to make is because we are not interested in how much just outcomes vary across people. We are really interested in how much, how much the incremental outcome between two treatments vary across people. And, and that's, I think, is, the, is the, uh, also the, uh, the goal of CER and, and PICOR kind of uh, methods. Um, I'll start by acknowledging some of, some of my um, NIH uh, funding and also support from the ARC uh, grant for a conference that discusses these issues at great length. Um, so as a recap, um, we all know that instrumental variables are variables that influence treatment choices but are independent of factors that determine potential outcomes. Um, we uh, view IVs as natural randomizers and, and there's a lot of discussion of where and how we find IVs. But my, um, my talk would be mostly focused on if you find an IV, IV, how do we implement it, how do we use it, and how do we interpret the results coming out of an IV, especially when there is treatment effect heterogeneity. Um, IVs can be, um, as, as we know, IVs can be used to establish, if, if you have a good IV, uh, to, for causal of treatment effects, taking into account both the hidden and the overt biases. And one classic example is uh, Therese Tuckle and colleagues' work where they looked at uh, using Medicare data effect of invasive cardiac treatment on long-term mortality rate, and uh, their observed confounders were um, age, sex, race, the general things that you find in, in, in Medicare data, but their unobserved confounder was the risk of patients, and the, and the concern was that low-risk patients were given the invasive cardiac treatment. And so uh, with adjustment, they found with propensity score or regression analysis, they found a huge effect, positive effect of um, invasive cardiac treatment. But when they did um, the IV analysis, which they used regional catheterization rate as an IV, they found that effect actually was not as substantial as it was in, in the regression analysis. And they kind of adjusted for um, the selection of lower treatment, uh, lower risk patients uh, for uh, invasive cardiac treatment. But I'm going to build on that and talk about um, how we interpret the results of an IV analysis uh, when there is treatment effect heterogeneity. So in the presence of treatment effect heterogeneity, there are very, very um, interesting things that come up. The first of all is that there is no reason to believe that the causal effect of a treatment that comes out of an observational study should be the same as the causal effect of a treatment comes, comes out of the RCT. We had some discussions this morning about it. But if you believe that there is any kind of selection that goes on into who enrolls in clinical trial and there is heterogeneity, which Mark pointed out, you know, those average effects shouldn't, shouldn't be the same. The average treatment effect itself you know, becomes uh, you know, not a very useful parameter because what the average treatment says is that what if, if, if I give the treatment to everyone in my population versus not, and, and, and often at the individual patient level, that's never the case. And more importantly, the IV effect um, fails to have a relevant um, interpretation, and, and I'm going to talk about how we um, address that problem. So um, throughout today, and, and also the literature, when we talk about causal inference, uh, about various methods, um, much of it is based on the fact how we manipulate choices, um, choices of treatment. And yet there has been no discussion about how do you model choices, and I think that's fundamental to any method that we study um, uh, on ca causal inference. So I'm going to um, discuss some of the intuition between you know, what the choice model can tell, uh, tell us about interpretation of these methods. Um, and I'm going to discuss some of the new development in IV methods based on the local instrumental variable methods um, that could be used to identify some relevant parameters, um, and my recent work on patient-centered treatment effects. So um, many of you may, may have seen this. Uh, usually when we model choice, uh, suppose we are considering a binary treatment, D, and um, the choice of D is based on some underlying latent index, uh, U star. So if U star is greater than zero, it's, which is an arbitrary threshold, um, we, we assume that D equals to one of people choose to get treatment. And if U star is less than zero, people do not get treatment. Um, a formal model for these latent index could be developed as that U star, which is this underlying latent index, could be a function of many characteristics. 
Um, some of the characteristics are uh, we observe them and they are confounders. Some of them are instrumental variables which we ob also observe. Uh, but also there could be other confounders that we do not observe and just pure stochastic error. And so this, the, the, this additive formulation of the latent U star is pervasive across all choice model in all literature, both in statistics and, and econometrics. So taking this as a basis for choice model, we can say a lot about who select into treatment and who does not select into treatment and how identification of treatment effect happens when we are dealing with instrumental variable. To, to show this, let's, um, let's examine a very, very stylized case. So here we have a line, which is uh, a line which represents the U star, which is a real scale line. It goes to, from minus infinity to, in, uh, to infinity. And we have our observed confounders given by green, our instrument given by blue, and my unobserved confounders given by red. And suppose that the observed confounder XO um, contributes minus one units to that utility score. And my instrument contributes another minus one to utility score. And my unobserved confounder contributes plus one to the utility score. So if you add them up, we have U star minus one. And there we would expect that uh, people would not choose treatment because U star is negative. So if you take this simple construct uh, into consideration, then the way IV, instrumental variable um, methods, estimate a treatment effect is they compare a group of people with some IV level versus another group of people with another IV level, keeping their observed characteristics same. So here is a group of people whose XO is exactly the same. Their Z values contribution is exactly the same. Obviously, their unobserved confounders level vary. There's a marginal distribution of unobserved confounder. We then compare this group of people to another group of people who have the exact same XO value, but slightly different Z values. By definition, since I'm moving only the Z values, the distribution of unobserved confounders shouldn't change. It should be exactly the same as before, right? So now we have based on their specific values of Z, XO, and XU, I have a treatment selection, treatment uh, choice, zero or one, attached to every patient in the data. And attached to that, we have the outcomes. So if the per person do does not get treatment, we observe their potential outcome Y0. If the person gets treatment, we observe their potential outcome Y1. So now, uh, if we con con compare these outcomes between two treatments, for this person, who does not get treatment and gets Y0 is the same as this person who does not get treatment um, and also gets Y0 because Y0 is only a function of XO and XU, your unobserved, unobserved and observed confounders. So when you take the difference in outcomes between these two groups, these, those things cancel out and the treatment effect is estimated only for those group of people whose treatment choice changes because due to the change in the instrument. Right? So there is a very, uh, the, the, the important thing to uh, uh, consider here is that this treatment effect is also conditional on the specific value of the unobserved confounder which makes them choose treatment or uh, switch treatment values based on the uh, value of the instrument. So this unobserved confounder could have been you know, 1.6, could have been 1.7, yet we would find the same result. Um, if somebody uses a different instrument that moves the instrument value at a different level, these unobserved confounders would have been set at a different value. So as long as treatment effects are not heterogeneous across those unobserved confounders, we don't have nothing to worry about. But if treatment effects are heterogeneous, then this treatment effect from the IV is conditional on an unobserved level of confounders um, that is arbitrary. It really depends on the instrument. So this causes a lot of problem. And, and, and you know, Heckman and Wittlesil has called this essential heterogeneity. Um, this arises when, in, from the epidemiology point of view, when, when, treatment, uh, when unobserved confounders moderate treatment effects. So there is treatment effect heterogeneity across unobserved conf confounders. Um, IV effect has generalizability issues just as much as when an R-city has generali generalizability issue because even within an R-city, it's internally valid. It's still conditioning on the unobserved level 
uh, of those who selected to enroll in the, in, in the clinical trial. Um, so to understand um, how we can get out of this situation, at least with an IV analysis, um, there has been these new um, variety of methods proposed, which is called the local instrumental variable, uh, or LIV. And what LIV does, it helps identify the marginal treatment effects, or the treatment effect of a person who is at the margin of choice defined by the choice model. And let me uh, illustrate what that means. So again, suppose you, you consider two groups of people, one group of people here and another group of people. Here, this person is at the margin of choice because their observed and unobserved, uh, their observed confounder and instrument exactly balances with the unobserved confounding. So their utility score is zero and, and assumption is, well, they are taking one. You can, you can also assume they are taking zero. And now if you change the instrument by an epsilon value, so it's, you're not moving arbitrarily the instrument value, you're, you're changing the instrument by a very small amount, and you're seeing who chooses treatment, whose treatment choices change, then the treatment effect is based, we, you know that, that this treatment effect belongs to a person whose unobserved level is such that it exactly balances the levels of, the, of your observed uh, choice model. So you can point identify the, the, the hypothetical patient for whom you're estimating a treatment effect. And that's the marginal treatment effect concept. Now once you get your marginal treatment effect, and, and you can get your marginal treatment effect condition on various levels of observed and unobserved characteristics, then you can answer pretty much uh, lots of questions in, 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 the, in, the, in the parameter space. So you can use this, um, as I said, the marginal treatment effect is a conditional treatment effect of an individual with specific levels of your observed characteristics, but also a specific level of unobserved characteristics that is defined by the choice model given your observed uh, instrument and observed characteristics. And once you get your MTEs, you can aggregate across you know, uh, various populations to give your um, treatment effect parameter, average treatment effect, or, um, or um, a treatment effect on the treated. In fact, um, and, and this is one of the estimator I'll skip. This is how you do it in a two-step fashion and using a control function. But uh, there's a new paper that's coming out in the Journal of Applied Econometrics where I extended this framework to actually uh, form this person-centered treatment effect. And the idea is simple, is once you calculate your MTEs, you can then aggregate them uh, for each person, each patient in your sample. Um, and the way you do it is that suppose you go back to your sample and you observe this patient. Um, their observed confounders contributes minus one to their utility score. Their Z contributes minus one, and you observe them to not take treatment. This implies that there's a, dis there's a distribution of your unobserved confounding that conforms to this, both this choice and these levels. And, and when you average over those distribution of MTEs, you can get a person-centered treatment effect. So I'll just, in, in the interest of time, I'll show how I applied it. I applied it in a, in a Medicaid data to evaluate um, antipsychotic drugs. And, and in, this, in this case, the Medicaid data is the right population to look at where there are, most of the patients with schizophrenia are in that population. There's very less churning in that population, and the outcome, the primary outcome, which is hospitalization, is extremely um, uh, well measured, at least in, in that data. And, 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 and so uh, what I'll do is I'll show you that when we estimated the average effect, and I'm looking at all, all hospitalization and schizophrenia-related hospitalization, the average effect was 0.35, was highly significant, and this is comparing a generic group of antipsychotic to a branded group of antipsychotic. Uh, but among people who initiate with generic group in practice, the average effect is not significant. And here there is benefits in terms of schizophrenia-related hospitalization. In fact, if people initiate in branded group and you force them to start on generic, you would increase their hospitalization, overall hospitalization significantly. And to understand more broadly, remember we can estimate a treatment effect for each individual in the sample, you can actually you know, plot the whole distribution of treatment effects. And on one axis, we have one outcome, and the other axis, on one outcome. This could be also seen, you know, done for benefits and risk, and really understand the distribution of treatment effects across um, different outcomes for the same patients. And, and what the more, most important point I, I will uh, mention is that th th there is not only tremendous heterogeneity, but if you try to explain this heterogeneity with one covariate, which is done in most subgroups, 
they explain a very little amount of this overall heterogeneity. And so under, you know, doing broad subgroup analysis to figure out if there is heterogeneity or not is really, in most cases, could be misleading. Um, and then we can look at selection. Uh, are people who are selecting to receive treatment, are they benefiting on average or not? And we can also do many policy analysis. For example, this would come out of a uh, treatment effect, um, ra big randomized trial, and you would get a 0.35 difference. But when you compare them to status quo, it would still be, um, it would be very different. So I think overall understanding heterogeneity um, of treatment effect or estimating treatment effects um, in the causal framework um, would need, in, in terms of observational study, a good understanding of what choice model um, can tell us and what choice model we can assume in terms of modeling these choices. And then um, these treatment effects could be used as outcome to generate algorithms for uh, treatment effect heterogeneity. Okay, time, time for uh, comments. Mary Charlson is, uh, is the uh, William T. Foley Distinguished Professor of Medicine at, and Executive uh, uh, Director of the Center for Integrative Medicine and Chief of the Division of Clinical Epidemiology and Evaluative Sciences at uh, Weill Cornell Medical College. Mary, thank you.